Hey everyone, Cleo here and we are diving into my July wrap up. So July could be considered one of my worst reading months of the year. Uh, it is technically not because in January I read less pages. But I do feel like in January at least I was like sticking to a goal, I was accomplishing a goal. And in July I very much fell off the bandwagon where it comes to reducing my physical TBR, where it comes to like sticking to the intentions set in my pile of possibilities. And furthermore I set the intention to read more fantasy and I almost didn't get around to any fantasy. So I definitely want to change that again in August. But so let's dive into the um, wrap up. So as always I do a wrap up but I also do a haul section in which I tell you the books that I bought this month so that I can let you know whether my physical TBR went up or whether it went down. So uh, I will start with the fantasy books because that was supposed to be my focus for this month. So first off, let me talk about The Empire of Gold by S.A. Chakraborty. So The Empire of Gold is a third book in the Devaba trilogy uh, and it is a trilogy that is Middle Eastern inspired, so Middle Eastern inspired fantasy. We are looking at the society of the Jinn and into this society we drop a sort of person who knows nothing about this world who is Nari. Nari grew up on the streets of Cairo, she was kind of swindler not really walking the straight and narrow but she had to in order to be able to survive but then um, through her actions she draws the attention of a jinn and this jinn recognizes that the sort of abilities that she's had all of her life that make her feel like she's unlike other people around her but she doesn't really know why she's different he recognizes that she probably has some jinn um, descendants, that she is probably a Jinn descendant, and he sweeps her way into the city of Devabad. Now once she gets into the city of Devabad, she's very much thrust into a political intrigue because of her um, ancestry. Uh, and our political scheming is going to go on through the three books and is very much going to be focusing on these sort of prejudices that exist between the different Jinn tribes and between the Jinn and the Shafit. And the Shafit, they are these sort of half-breeds that exist between Jinn and humans. And this sort of political intrigue is what really drew me into this series. You know, I read the series super fast. I started it in June. And considering the length of especially these latter two novels in the series, um, that's quite a feat for me. And um, I really enjoyed the first one. I gave the first one five stars, second one four stars, third one. 3.5 stars I guess. So sadly the series did go downhill for me but that is personal preference because I have seen a whole lot of people have the opposite experience. Now for me personally what drew me into the first series was like that lush uh, world, that rich atmosphere, that uh, new type of fantasy, you know, Middle Eastern inspired fantasy that I hadn't read yet and because I've always been fascinated by Egypt for example, this sort of whole um, Middle Eastern vibe, this whole Middle Eastern atmosphere that was given into the story really sat well with me. Um, but apart from that, what really drew me was the characters and the um, political intrigue. And I feel like we're missing that a little bit, especially where political intrigue is concerned in the latter book, in the last book. So we very much start off with a political intrigue heavy book. Uh, and then in that second book, we are introduced, like, in that first book we are establishing the board, the way that the pieces are set, what we are trying to accomplish. Second book we are continuing along with that, we have made a time jump, but uh, we are very much still r running the same game, let's say. But we are also getting hints of like a new pawn that's trying to enter the board and shake things up. And that shaking up of the board is what didn't suit well with me, because I think that in that third book we are going too much into like black and whites. There's too much like this is the enemy, they are the bad ones because of what they do at the end of book two. And uh, these are the good guys. And so it's black and white. Who we want to destroy, why we want to destroy it, it's all clear cut. And while we have a clear enemy in the first books, there's a lot more of a grey zone there. This other enemy, the first enemy is shown to have a lot more um, depth to its perspective and it's shown to be caring as well as being uh, as being behind some atrocious events. There's very much more of a logic behind it uh, whereas the character that we are facing in the final book has very much gone past all sorts of reasonable limits and so she that 
And so that character is a clear, like, it's like a Sauron enemy, and I don't like that at all. Um, characters, I still love them, um, but yeah, it's also still, it also fell a little bit flat for me in that sense, but that just might have to do with plot developments, because uh, I feel like the first two books were a lot more character focused and the third one is a lot more plot centered. And um, while that's not necessarily a bad thing, I also felt like a lot of those plot developments were very typical de developments. They were like uh, developments that I've seen done so many times in fantasy that they don't really offer a whole lot of new um, material and so that kind of disappointed me. But all in all, I still very much love the Dave of the Trilogy, will definitely reread it at some point as well. Second fantasy that I read this month is The Obelisk Gate by N.K. Jemison. This is also a uh, later book in the series. This is the second book in the Broken Earth Trilogy. Um, so in this trilogy we are looking at a Earth that has basically been wasted away. We're basically at the premise, we're basically at the start of the end of the world. There's a huge chasm that has been um, created in the middle of this world and there's a lot of seismic activity and things like that, so people are very much struggling to survive. And in this society you have people called Origins who have the power to control these sort of shakes, they have the power to exert some control over the earth, but they are very much looked down upon. They're very much seen as the source of the problem and so uh, people very much are afraid of them, of what they can do, and they also very much look down upon them as them being the filth on the streets. And in this and in this first book in the trilogy we are looking at three perspectives, um, three origins at different points in their life, at different points of their training. Second book picks up from where we left things off and uh, in that second book we will actually be introducing some other perspectives and for some of these we will be jumping back to the beginning of book one. Um, but what I very much like about this one is that it is a little bit more advanced fantasy in the sense that you need to, you're kind of going to feel lost a lot more than you do with regular fantasy. You kind of have to uh, connect the strings yourself a little bit more so it's very much not a like beginner's uh, fantasy because you're not really given the pieces from time to time you're giving a little bit more than other times but a lot of the times you're gonna feel a little bit lost and also in terms of the narrative structure it does uh, it is all a little bit more experimental in this one and so it uh, feels a little bit more like a literary fiction for example in that sense we also for example have a second person narrator in this um, so that can be kind of like weird at the beginning if you go into it but that's also part of the reason why I absolutely loved it because it is so unlike any other fantasy series that I've read. So uh, another selling point for this one is that all three books in this series have won the Hugo Awards. The third one in the series, The Stone Sky, is on my list for August and I hope to get around to it. From fantasy it's an easy jump into sci-fi. So I read the seventh volume of Saga, so I won't go into it much because of spoilers, but so Saga is a sci-fi adult uh, comic series in which we are following. It's kind of Romeo and Juliet stories set in space. So we have these two characters from warring races who fall in love with one another and they uh, are expecting a child at the beginning of the first one and so we're following them as they uh, try to find a place on in this galaxy that is safe for them to start their family. Uh, I very much love this series. I will say, like, if you go into this one, to give it more than just the first volume. The first volume is so introductory that it can, like, it doesn't necessarily blow you away or it doesn't necessarily grip you, but I was hooked from the moment that I picked up the second one. So I think I gave five out of seven volumes that I've read so far, a five star rating. Uh, so it's definitely a uh, wor a series worth diving into. Um, and so yeah, this one, uh, I really like that it dived into a couple of like um, instances of dealing with grief. And um, so it has, it packed a few punches in there. And so I also shed a few tears. Let's see, uh, let's now talk about the Booker Prize 2019 long-listed books. So uh, if you follow this channel for a bit, then you might know that it is one of my goals to uh, read all of the long-listed books for the Booker Prize. The shortlist is my main goal, but this year I've tried to do the long list as well. And so in the month of July, I read 
three books off of that long list. So the first one that I read for that is The Man Who Saw Everything by Deborah Levy. This is a story set in sort of like two time periods. We are looking at um, our protagonist Paul, no Saul. We are looking at him in two different places as well. So he's, we start off the story on uh, Abbey Road in London as he's recreating the picture that the Beatles took there. But a lot of the story will be about his time uh, in the DDR, so in the East Berlin um, regime, where he spends some time in order to do some research and he forms a strong relationship while there. But we're also looking at present day, I think 2016 or something, Saul, and um, that sort of things get complicated. It's very much a book that's looking at like the fluctuation of time and the impact of memory on time, the impact of memory on like the way we imagine events and things like that. So a lot of times you will feel like you'll be reading a passage set within the East Berlin time period that will feel like the future is creeping into it. You, he will have the character say things that indicate that he has future knowledge and at the same time, the same happens in the future time period later on where a lot of the times you're confused about which time zone, which time period you are in and he seems to be start struggling to figure that out for himself as well, you know, he seems to be stuck, getting sucked back into his East Berlin time um, self. It was a relatively normal novel up until the halfway point and then we really start to meddle with time, with memory, and you really start to get lost. Um, all in all, I appreciated what it was trying to do, but it just left me feeling kind of meh. It didn't really do all that much to me, sadly. Secondly, I read Nightboat to Tangier by Kevin Barry, and that's more or less the same story. Uh, I liked it, but it didn't really blow me away, and like there was nothing there to make me... Um, there was nothing there for that story to stick with me, you know. In Nightboat to Tangier we're looking at two old men sitting in a port terminal in uh, Algeciras in Spain. They are waiting for um, the estranged daughter of one of them because they haven't seen her for a very long period of time and they have been kind of hunting her down and there are clues that she will be showing up that day. And throughout we're getting flashbacks of their lives when they were younger men and they were very much crooks involved in like drug dealing and stuff like that and we're looking at those time periods as well but I personally really only liked the um, present day uh, bits I very much liked the whole vibe we had in that poor terminal that was very much like reminiscent of waiting for Godot and I just really thought that that worked well and I also think that it would work very well in cinematic form and I actually think that the whole would work better for me in cinematic form I think I think I can easily see this be like a Martin Scorsese movie or something like that I think his uh, directing style and his cinematography would work very well for this sort of story but for me it just always stayed on like a middle level, there were no highs or lows, it just always just like trucked along there and that just meant that I didn't really engage all that much with the story neither. Uh, so sadly that was also a letdown for me and this is going to continue because my Booker month really wasn't that successful because the final book that I had to read was the final book for the shortlist as well and that was Kishot by Salman Rushdie which based on the title, you can already tell, is a Don Quixote retelling. Uh, I have not read the Don Quixote yet, it is on my schedule somewhere this year, hopefully. Um, but so, in this retelling of Don Quixote, um, our main character, Quixote, is um, somebody who has been driven mad by watching too much reality TV. So he is a reality TV fanatic, he watches it all the time, and he falls in love with one of the hosts on TV, called Salma and so he is embarking on a quest to try and win her love and accompanying him on that quest is an imaginary son uh, called Sancho. Now I had wrong expectations going into it to begin with because I was expecting it to be very much a uh, story about Quixote and um, Sancho going off on a quest towards their 
damsel in distress, let's call her like that. But we are very much getting a whole lot more perspectives and that was definitely a problem for me in the beginning with getting into this book because I think for the first 150 pages or something you're getting a chapter from a different perspective every single time. And so you're not continuing on with that Don Quixote story until very much later into the novel, which very much didn't work for me. Um, I appreciate some of the things that this novel was doing, it's very much trying to play with the borders between fiction and reality. The way that the Don Quixote is also giving a commentary on that self same subject, but uh, so we also have multiple layers to this book because we have the story of Don Quixote and his imaginary Sancho, but this story is written by an imaginary author within this book and then this author has a sister as well uh, and his life story is getting reflected into the story of Quixote that he's writing and then of course there's an added layer of us knowing that that author is also written by an author so it's very much looking at the borders between fiction and reality very much um, bending time and space a whole lot throughout this book a lot of times things will be happening that are totally weird there's a lot of symbolic stuff into this my main problem with this is first which is incredibly difficult to get through because uh, of the because I wasn't compelled I wasn't intrigued I wasn't uh, engrossed in any of what the things that was happening or in any of the characters but especially with the characters I feel like they were just there as tools you know they were he had this grand idea about blending fiction and reality but there was no grasp into characters for me there was no compelling link with any of these characters that was driving us through that book. They were just very much there to enact a idea he had about a plot he wanted to work out. Um, what I did like was representation of race in this book. So this Sancho character that he has imagined is having his first experiences with race in America. It is a character who has just been given life, so he steps into this world fully innocent and then he will be exposed to racism. He will start to fear strangers, to fear using his own language, to fear um, being put in the spot of attention and uh, we will see him changing throughout as a result of the racism that he is exposed to. And I very much like that but it was very much a small part of a big whole. So I've read some reviews that said that Salman Rushdie was just trying to do too many things in this book and so he ended up not fulfilling any of those um, things to their fullest extent and I definitely get by that. Uh, let me talk about a realization for this month. So I read Trick Mirror by Gia Tolentino, which is a uh, essay collection and I figured out that I really like listening to essay collections or reading essay collections. So I listened to an essay a day for this one and I just really enjoyed the experience of winding down my day with listening to an essay. Um, as for this essay collection in itself, so it's called Trick Mirror Reflections on Self-Delusion. So the essays are very much about how we as individuals uh, delude ourselves, for example, through social media trying to portray ourselves in a certain way that might not be our true selves, but also uh, how the society is enacting these acts of delusion, enacting these acts of um, presenting facts in a way that are necessarily true. For example, looking at like the representation of females in literature, the way that females are represented in a certain way, the way in which society is putting this image in front of us as if that is the way women are supposed to be, for example. I think I enjoyed most of these essays and I very much liked the essay about, uh, I think it's called Seven Scams, something with seven scams. The story of a generation in seven scams. So I very much like that one, but for the majority of the essays I do feel like it would have been nice to have her link back to this self-delusion uh, elements and indicate like exactly what she means with self-delusion in those essays. Uh, a lot of them were written before, so she just entered them into this uh, essay collection. Some of them were written especially for this essay collection. But I did sometimes feel like I didn't really know why she was writing those essays. I didn't really feel the like um, 
reason behind these essays or the conclusions that she was trying to reach within these essays. But I definitely uh, realized that I really enjoyed this format and I will be uh, trying to dive into more of it in the future. I finished The Penultimate Peril by Lemony Snicket, the 11th, no the 12th book in the series of Unfortunate Events. Very much loved this one uh, as well. Uh, it was very much looking at like the f past few books have done this very much looking at like good versus evil and how to tell good and evil apart so the adults in this book are very much always saying that it's easy to tell good people apart from bad people you just have to look at their actions however this book is constantly showing that uh, just by looking at these actions you cannot really tell because these actions can be interpreted in many ways, you can be missing information, but also a good person can be doing bad things and a bad person can be doing good things. And they will also be asking these questions about themselves. So very much looking forward to finishing this series in August. Uh, I have definitely been enjoying my time with it and this is definitely one of my favorite ones so far. Another one that I finished this month is Exciting Times by Nisha Dolan. This was a debut novel and uh, it has been getting quite some attention so uh, because it's short it was on script I wanted to get around to it as well um, but I will say that I had the same sort of experience that I had with The Man Who Saw Everything and I wrote to Tangier where I just felt kind of meh about it. I didn't really feel um, drawn into the main character so our main character is an expat living in Hong Kong. She's very much just like she very much just feels like a character who doesn't know what she wants the entire time and she's also just like coasting off of her boyfriend so she gets involved with this guy who's not really a boyfriend, it's more like friends with benefits situation and he's a rich banker and like he's she's living in his apartment at some point in the novel he's buying all, her all of these gadgets and she's also really actively asking for these things she's actively asking for him to buy certain things for her and um she doesn't seem to like feel any sort of guilt about that or to feel uh like any sort of way that i would feel that i would think is a normal sort of reaction to this situation and then when he is off like for a longer extended period she starts to form a an attraction to a uh, woman and I liked that relationship very much but the development of the storyline from there also didn't really sit well with me but also just there was almost no emotional impact from this story and I don't know whether that was the audiobook because I was also quite irritated with the audiobook because I just felt like the way in which the um, boyfriend was given voice to just felt like so robotic, like the posh accent definitely didn't work um, and yeah it just felt like this guy had zero emotion and like this was such a bad person and I didn't understand why she was staying with him or why she was even with him to begin with based off of the way that this role was interpreted within the audiobook. So yeah, that didn't, definitely didn't do it for me so sadly I've had quite some books this month that didn't really work for me. Luckily I also did have like Saga Volume 7 which I absolutely loved, The Obelisk Gate which I absolutely loved and I did have the accomplishment of finishing the Booker Long List for 2019 uh, and I will be diving into the Booker Long List 2020. As for the books that I purchased, uh, one sec. So, in terms of the physical books that I finished, there were sadly only four this month and that's going to be a bit of a problem. <laughs> One of which was a new purchase, but I also purchased four books. So, I didn't make any progress in my physical TBR this month. I definitely hope to be making better progress in August, but in August I also put quite a lot of ebooks and audiobooks on my TBR, so we'll see what happens. So, uh, I've bought an this will be the easiest to start with. Three volumes of Saga, so volume 7, which I've already read, volume 8, and volume 9. Um, so I've already talked about them, so I won't go that deeper into it, but yeah, this is the... If I finish those, I'm caught up with, with the Saga series. So I'm hoping for new volumes soon, but I haven't heard anything yet. And so I also purchased Meanwhile in Dopamine City by DBC Pierre. 
I will admit that this is a cover by, <laughs> but I'm also very much intrigued by the story now because this is a story about a man who um, he is a single parent taking care of his child. Um, he is like very much middle class, probably more like lower class. He really doesn't have a whole of whole lot of resources available but so his daughter very much wants a smartphone so he saves up for her to have one but once she gets a smartphone she starts to get um, he starts to feel like he's losing her she's spending more and more time in her room alone and he feels like he's losing her to this digital world so it's very much going to be looking at like um, our dependency on social media, on uh, these new sort of like technological advancements that we've seen ri rising over the past decades. Um, and so I think it's going to be very interesting. I am very much intrigued also with why there's a sort of Pikachu on the cover. But uh, yeah, I absolutely love this cover and uh, I think I'm, I'm hoping, but I think I'm going to love this book as well. Um, so yeah, that would be my July wrap up and book haul. So no progress in my physical TBR. I'm still at 121 unread books on my shelves. And hopefully the month of August will uh, see that changing. So yeah, let me know down below if you've read any of these books and we can chat about them in the comments some a little bit more. And so yeah, see you guys for the next one. Bye.